How's it everybody? Welcome to Exponential Africa Live, a weekly live show that focuses on bringing the best thought leadership, technology and innovation to the African continent and the world. Our mission as Singularity U South Africa and Manmade is to help hashtag future-proof Africa by building a global community of change makers who can help solve some of Africa's and the world's greatest challenges and lead the way during this technological transformation. We all know that the world will never be the same because of COVID-19, but one thing is for sure. The people who keep pushing, working and producing to make the world a better place will be the ones that do. That's why we are going to bring you valuable insights and knowledge that can help you, inspire you, help empower you and help you and your colleagues to positively change the world. Today we will be covering agility in a time of crisis. Because as Einstein liked to say, in the midst of every crisis lies great opportunity. And for us, it's really that mindset shift that makes all the difference. So we'll be covering a few of the latest exponential tech stories around agility, looking both globally and locally. Then I'm proud to say we'll do a deep dive in how to be agile in a time of crisis in our interview segment of the show with some amazing guests who will be joining us here today. We will have Ramez Nam, Singularity University faculty and world-renowned energy and innovation expert, Kim Hewlett, SUSE faculty and founder and CEO of Next Biosciences, and Ashley Anthony, SUSE, also SUSE faculty on AR and CEO of Isazi.ar. A huge shout out goes out to our partners who this would Africa, our global partner Deloitte and our strategic partner MTN. Thanks for your commitment and dedication to making a positive impact in South Africa and Africa. Lastly, if you want to see more of these weekly episodes, make sure to like and subscribe to our YouTube page and register on the website to get info and be eligible for the giveaways. Super, let's jump right into it. Cleanliness is the path to keeping healthy and a chemical manufacturing startup called Hexagon creates anti-corrosion coatings for buildings and has pivoted into manufacturing sanitizer full time. This helped them keep all the staff while providing hospitals with sanitizer as a non-profit. Amazing! Another example of this but a little bit different is Psychopomp, the Bristol based gin distillery that also made the switch from alcohol to hand sanitizer paid on a donation basis. Robots to the rescue. Starship so Technologies, which section. builds and operates autonomous be, um, robots, are rolling them out to more cities as demand for contactless delivery rises. Now with the COVID-19 forcing traditional restaurants to close and placing more pressure on gig economy workers. Starship Technologies has an opportunity to accelerate that growth. I'm proud to say that I recently found out that the CEO is Lex Bayer, who was my head boy at school and a running friend. Go South Africa! Help spot COVID with the eyes of the computer. Originally set up to do large-scale monitoring of remote areas, e.g. at sea, Archangel Imaging flipped the script and started doing COVID-19 fever detection using technology and cameras, similar to the big eyes in the sky in China. Thank you, AR. Gopher is a delivery network that works with SMEs and apps like Deliveroo or Airbnb, transporting goods, scooters, and large food orders. In the wake of COVID, however, that business-to-business -business demand has shrunk, so the company has partially pivoted to delivering pharma, biosamples, and test kits for labs, pharmacies, and medical companies, using their convoy of delivery workers to get essential goods to people. Pivoting Retail London's famous Harrods has done some out-of-the-store thinking with free personal shopping assistants that help you over the phone and then send you photos and videos to help make your choice. Then voila, delivery arrives promptly. Pivoting retail continued. In Russia, retail chain Vokusvil decided to take their retail to the people and built these massive vending machines in residential buildings that have everything you need, allowing people the benefit of retail prices and quality without having to leave their homes. Can CRISPR fight COVID-19? 
Scientists at Sandia National Lab are exploring the gene editing tool CRISPR to see if they can reprogram genes to suppress the COVID-19 virus. 3D printing offers an answer. Origin, a San Francisco-based company, changed direction when they went from being a 3D printing manufacturer to becoming a medical device manufacturer with a focus on COVID-19 testing kits. The company says they can print up to 1,500 swabs in a single print in under eight hours. 3D printing has many, many answers, and I really love it. Now it's time for our Africa Spotlight, which is a part of the show where we highlight some amazing innovations and a display of exponential thinking. And today we're going to highlight a great display of being agile in a time of crisis. Next Biosciences, a genetics laboratory based in Johannesburg, took swift action and on lockdown went from ideation to validation for COVID-19 testing within record time of two weeks and by the Easter weekend was providing testing for healthcare workers. This wouldn't be possible without Isazi's help of building AR around OCR so that the test requisition forms can be scanned at the point of swabbing, resulting in the patient's details required by the NRCD being loaded onto the lab information management system, enabling the barcoded swabs to be processed immediately upon arriving at the lab, with the results being issued in less than 24 hours. Next, Biosciences and Isazi are now looking at some other innovative concepts to further speed up testing and reduce cost. Cost and time to get a COVID-19 test result remain their biggest challenge, which needs to be solved if we want to get everyone back to school and work, and to get our economy kick-started. It's great to know that we'll be hearing from Kim and Ashley around this later on in the show. And there are many, many stories of these types of pivots and agility. If you have any you would like to share, please do so in the comment section on YouTube. We would love to hear from you. As you've heard, the show is free and will continue to always be free. And if you feel you're getting great value and appreciate what we're trying to do, you can scan the QR code on your screen and make a donation. All the proceeds from tonight's donations will go to help helping educate students in South Africa. Maharishi Institute has switched almost 1,000 students to online. Concurrently running online daily. All these students are from really tough financial backgrounds, but about 21% of the students have either not been able to join classes at all or on the verge of dropping out because of the lack of data and some because of access to internet-enabled devices. As these students fall more and more behind, they risk not being able to catch up and lose the opportunity of graduating and getting employment into a quality job. It's unlikely we will be able to resume face-to-face -face classes in the near term, and as my Rishi Institute would be considered a mass gathering because of the density of people in one space. Any help would be hugely appreciated with any internet accessible phones or tablets and assistance with helping students with data co costs for attending classes raised through the online session. So you can scan the QR code on the screen and all the proceeds will go to Maharishi Institute to help educate South Africans by giving them data as well as devices. We'll leave the QR code up on the screen as much as possible, allowing you the opportunity to donate. This is a great South, proudly South African platform we're using called Busker. We are now going to move into the next, into, it's time to move into the main segment of tonight's show, the Agility in a Time of Crisis panel. The world is going through a monumental shift and it's up to all of us to help fix our current problems and build the future we want to live in. We need to be agile and adaptable and there are going to be very challenging times ahead. But we have to stay united and positive so that through collaboration, we can design a better future. I'm proud to welcome tonight's guests. Tonight we have Ramez Nam, Kim Hewlett and Anthony Ashley. Ramez Nam is the co-chair for energy and environment at Singularity University. And Ramez is a former Microsoft executive and innovation expert. And over the last decade, he's become a clean energy thought leader, speaker and investor. Kim Hewlett. 
Kim Hewlett is the founder and CEO of Next Biosciences, a biotech company which owns the largest stem cell bank on the continent and is the market leader in reproductive genetics testing. Kim has a computer science degree and qualified as a chartered accountant. Kim is also the S. Sousa faculty for designer babies, longevity and biotech. And our last guest is Ashley Anthony. Ashley is the CEO and co-founder of Asazi.ai, a company that is focused on practical applications for machine learning and optimization. He is also a geophysicist by qualification and part of the Singularity faculty. Welcome guys, welcome to everybody to the show. Thanks, Mac. Ramez, it's great to have you. How are you doing? Thank you. I'm doing well. Nice to be in South Africa again, virtually. Awesome, man. Kim, Kim, great to have you. How are you doing? All good. I'm streaming from my, my lab, so good to be on the show. Thank you. Thanks. It's great to know that even while you're working and, and during this, uh, this time, you've made the time to be with us. So thank you so much. And uh, I don't know if Ashley's online yet. Ashley, are you there? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Hi, Mick. How are you doing? Great, great. Welcome to the show. Great. Thanks for having us. So, guys, um, we're talking about agility in a time of crisis. And uh, Kim, let's start with you. What, is, what does it mean to be agile and adaptable in your mind? And what can we do in this, this time of COVID? I think um, I like to use the analogy that we are all in the same storm. We're just in different boats. Some of us have, are in large cruise liners. Some of us are in little boats. Some have large sails. Others have speed engines. And we all have different crews navigating. The storm is really unpredictable. And no one knows. We, we just don't how bad it's going to get, how long it's going to last, and what it's going to look like when we come out of it. So what is really important now, as you've said, Nick, is adaptability and agility to navigate the storm with the resources that we have. So, and I mean, you've, you've had some incredible pivots in your own business. Do you want to tell us about some of that? We, we heard of it earlier in the Africa spotlight. What you and Ashley are doing is pretty amazing. Yes, if you want me to get on to um, how this all started, I think just to give you some background, as you have said, we are focused on um, stem cells and genetics, and we really in the reproductive pregnancy and newborn phase of life. So luckily for us, babies aren't going to wait, you know, for lockdown to be over, and they're not going to wait for vaccine to be developed. They keep getting born, and people will always have sex. So we're really lucky in our business. And when we were first approached to set up a COVID testing lab, I said, no, it's not our area of expertise and we'll leave it to the pathology labs. But after being asked again and again to help healthcare worker testing, because labs were really swamped with long turnaround times for testing, we, because we had some lab equipment that could be repurposed, we jumped in and went from ideation to this being validated in a record time of two weeks. And it really meant pulling on all our resources and our incredible teamwork 24-7 from the day of lockdown in setting up our COVID lab from scratch, sourcing equipment, reagents, hiring new staff when no one else was hiring, getting our processes validated and registered for SANUS accreditation, and also getting a new technology system developed to manage our process and ensure automated reporting to our patient and our doctor and to the NICD and Department of Health. And as you've mentioned, it was thanks to Ashley and his incredible team at Estasi that developed some AI to do reading of our test requisition form so that by the time our swabs arrived at our lab, we had all the data on our system, which enabled for quick turnaround times in terms of processing and reporting. So it really has, it was a very crazy two weeks and it has showed us that anything is really possible if you put your mind to it. And it was absolutely an exhausting time for all of us, but thrilling and inspiring, knowing that we've been able to help. Well, I think it's 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 it's, it's totally inspiring, and uh, it's just it's just it's a great example of how you can actually just flip the script uh, in in two weeks and, and change your whole business line. Mez, what do you think about this? Uh, I mean, I mean, you've heard a lot of amazing innovations. I've been reading all your posts online. 
You've been following the, the COVID uh, quite, quite closely. What are some of the amazing innovations you've seen? And what do you think of this example from, from Kim and Ashley? I think this, this example is amazing. And it's amazing to just be thinking about what are the problems that society has? What are the problems that humanity has? How can we address them? But look, not every company out there has uh, biotech expertise and can contribute directly to this, but it can be in little things as well. Uh, what we see is, you know, this is a time that's very stressful for consumers and they will remember uh, what companies they interact with treated them well or made them feel like they had a higher purpose or were uh, doing beneficial things. And that will create an affinity. Uh, so it's little things. It's the, the restaurant that donates meals to the local hospital staff. Uh, and it's about experimentation. It's just about try things, see what works, see what gets resonance with the customers in whatever way, and keep trying, keep iterating, keep changing, and see what actually sticks. And I mean, Ash, what was some of the AR that you guys developed? Do you want to just ex ex explain that a bit more to us? Ye yes, sure, Mick. Um, I think the, the most interesting piece or the true innovation on what, uh, what we created wasn't really just the recognition of a document, uh, which is basic OCR or optical character recognition as, as it's known. And that's been around since the 50s and 60s. Uh, but the problem with any document recognition is there's certain portions on a page that you, the, the algorithm fails at identifying. So there are certain fields on a specific page that you don't get a good accuracy or the algorithm is not confident on that certain field. And the real innovation was behind creating an actual game where each of these fields that the algorithm is uncertain or less confident about and having the ability to distribute it through a game to unemployed youth in South Africa in an anonymized and secure way that's aligned to GDPR and copy. So that really was the true innovation, was uh, the fact that we could take all these COVID applications and during this time, still find really sort of advanced technology, work with us locally, uh, chop out fields that it was not confident on this um, TRF or, or application form, and then get this farmed out to local youth in South Africa and on top of it all, they were doing it from home or they are currently doing it from home. So this means nobody has to travel to a central place and put them, their families and work colleagues at risk. And two is uh, an alternative is to outsource this work to a country like India. So what we're actually doing is keeping the money in our borders and using our unemployed youth to help us through this time and capture. It's almost we're distributing um, jobs at a micro scale. So this means somebody could log in for a few hours and earn enough money for, uh, for bread and milk, a micro amount that could make a difference today. So I think that really was, was, was the, uh, uh, the innovation, uh, but a combination of using AI and a whole lot of other tech and great partnerships, uh, for example, like NextBio to make this work. Wow, I think that's, that's really amazing. And, uh, um... I really, I really think that it's, it's, it's amazing how you've pivoted in your own business. And um, Mez, how, have you seen other examples of this, of AR and bio merging and converging, uh, or other exponential technologies that have converged to try help fight this disease? Yeah, I think the examples you gave of 3D printing were great ones. We've seen uh, companies working on 3D printing uh, face masks and PPE, for instance, 3D printing the clear uh, face shields that uh, physicians and nurses and so on need to use to protect themselves, for instance. Uh, we've seen people using uh, AI to look at data from internet connected thermometers to detect where there's fevers in different places around the US and I believe globally to try to predict where is there an upsurge of COVID uh, that hasn't been diagnosed yet? Uh, we've seen in this whole situation of data, the data is very uh, confusing because not every place on earth has the same uh, testing 
frequency being done so that just the confirmed case counts don't tell you necessarily what's going on. So we've seen publications like the Financial Times and The Economist uh, looking at other data of overall death rates, of what percentage of tests are coming back positive or negative to try to build a clearer picture of what's going on. So this is some really great work happening right now. Amazing. And, 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 and you talk a lot about, so with all this data that we're getting, you talk a lot about networks and about the power of the network. How, how important are and how valuable are these networks and partnerships during this time? Like what we've seen with NextBio and Isazi. Uh, you know, why are these networks important and, and what does it mean for us in the future? It's absolutely the case. I mean, if you look at all of the, the giant uh, success stories in, in the corporate world over the last couple of decades, they're almost all companies that focus on data and have a way to, to get more data and that build network effects. They're often platforms where every new partner they have makes them more valuable to customers. Every new customer makes them more valuable to platforms. Uh, so I think having those those connections right now, being able to talk to the other people in your ecosystem and figure out how can you do something better together uh, is more important than ever. But I'd say one, one word of caution, one uh, sort of uh, wrench being thrown into the gears is the data is now changing very rapidly. The shape of the data is. By what I mean by that is that if you have data on consumer behavior, for instance, that you use to optimize uh, your advertising or you use to optimize something else about your business, well, guess what? Consumer behavior just changed dramatically. If you have uh, data on energy consumption patterns uh, that you use to optimize something about your business or mobility, uh, guess what? All of that has changed dramatically. So one thing I see data scientists struggling with or trying to, to adapt to very rapidly is, okay, we had all this data that was fairly consistent for years, and now uh, we've had this sharp change, and now perhaps a trend line. How do we use the new data plus what we know from the old to try to make robust predictions? I think that's you've touched on quite an interesting uh, topic because that's a, that we're getting new data that we've never understood before. So exactly, Ashley, how are you? How are some of your clients pivoting with this sort of with this sort of problem with this new data sets coming in? I, I think Ramiz just nailed something um, so important that's happening in the artificial intelligence and in particular the machine learning community. Um, I mean, a great example, a great company that we work with is, is Unilever. And um, what, what, one of the things we've always, we, what we've used, or the, the goal of the project was really to have this integrated platform that will integrate everything that happens from a sales, marketing, and promotional side with supply chain. And uh, uh, a lot of our models across all our clients, just not Unilever, were heavily based on the standardized machine learning that's out there, your support vector machines, your random forest, your neural networks, sort of your black box AI. Where what's really good at taking in historical data and predicting a certain outcome. And um, when you have historical data uh, that followed a, sort of a trend or a repetitive format, uh, machine learning is fantastic of making these type of predictions or forecast. The complexity comes in when all of a sudden there's a multiple range of different data points that uh, we've never seen before. For example, uh, COVID. Um, the I, just the fact that uh, people's grant payments have changed, the amount, the average income has reduced. Uh, all these different complexities uh, make a lot of the machine learning not as applicable for this portion of time. And what we're seeing in the machine learning community is a large focus on something called agent-based models. And what these agent-based models are really um, instead of the standard machine learning, which is fitting, a, fitting your data to a model, this is really creating different types of simulations around your module. So you can basically set the different parameters or have a machine assist you in setting these parameters. What if certain paydays were shifted out, if grant payments were changed, if the times you could shop change? And it's these type of simulations that are allowing us or these agent type models 
that are allowing us to actually use a blend of machine learning, which is fantastic for historical data, but also having a blended approach, which uses for a large portion of it, also use this agent type model or, or agent model, as we call it. So it's a very interesting time uh, for, especially for the FMCG space and anybody interested in customer and consumer behavior. Um, so what's great about it is we, uh, as scientists and uh, artificial intelligence and everybody involved in this field is continuously looking at different types of methodologies, previously methodologies that may have been neglected because uh, they were not applicable previously. But now we're getting the opportunity to work with these techniques and mature them further and help contribute to the body of knowledge. No, I love it. It's, it's fantastic. I mean, even AR needs to adapt during this time. And, and it's so interesting to hear how, how that's, that's moving. Uh, Kim, we're getting a whole bunch of questions from people and we will answer as many of them as possible. One of them, Kim, is people asking, where can they, where can they get involved? How can they help get involved in this initiative? Helping us with uh, testing at our lab. <laughs> However, people want to help you. So I'm, I'm not... how, can they get, how can they get in touch with you? Well, you can get in touch with us on our website, I suppose. You can email us. I wasn't expecting people to offer their help. We have needed a lot of help, but we've got through most of most of the issues. Thank you. Um, but there's still a, we, we're working on... I think what would be interesting to the listeners is that we are working on a number of, I would say, rather innovative solutions. I can't get into them right now, but where we are looking to reduce testing time as well as reducing the cost fairly significantly. So it is a very exciting time for us. We, we are really hectic and um, hopefully we'll be able to solve some of these bigger issues that we can contribute on a bigger scale. But I, th I think also what, what's interesting is like, how do we go and how do we think about all of this? Because what we're really experiencing today is in Nassim Taleb's definition, it's a black swan. No one expected this and certainly no one planned for this. I mean, we discuss this, if someone took a bet with you in January that not there wouldn't be one sale of beer in April. I mean, it was inconceivable a few months ago that this would happen and there is just so much to learn about this virus and new information emerges every day and it really is impossible to predict the future in this unprecedented situation and this is where resilience and robustness is so important and um, this is where we have to be prepared in life and I, I like to refer to Ray Dalio when he says you've got to look back at history and try and see where they're patterned so you can understand a cause and effect relation. And the problem is that a lot of us, there's a lot of misunderstanding because we think we have to have one plan for a certain outcome and future. And we know that the world can change in an instant. And during these times of crisis, many of us are thinking about, gee, how's the world going to change? What's going to be different? And actually, we should be reversing our thinking to ask ourselves, what is not going to change? Okay, because what's not going to change is what we can control. So we can't control the storm. But what we can control is how we move our rudder or our sails, because we know if we move it in a certain way, the boat will turn. And this agility and adaptability doesn't always guarantee success, because sometimes we act very hastily. We don't have all the information at hand. But what is important is as this data evolves, that you are able to pivot as you never, like, yeah, as we navigate the storm. So those are just some of the, I suppose, lessons on how we think about things. No, th no, thanks so much for that. Let, I think it's so important to be resilient and to just weather the storm. And uh, in South Africa, we have a few, ch a few challenges ahead of us. And one of them is our energy sector. Um, and, uh, you know, Ramez, I want to turn this over to you. What you've been writing a lot about the state of energy globally. And um, what do you think about the South African energy sector at the moment? And how do we try to solve this crisis that we are facing uh, ahead of us? It's a great question. It's, it's a bad situation. It was already a bad situation in South Africa with ESCOM. And there's really only one way out of the situation. I mean, the, the problem is that ESCOM has this, this pile of debt and it's relatively inefficient as a company. 
And we now have this incredibly cheap energy from solar power and wind power, and ESCOM has a lot of old, inefficient, dirty coal plants. But right now it's been made worse because electricity demand has gone down, which hurts ESCOM sales. So the, the short term is just going to be very painful no matter what. But in the long term, the only way out is to grow your way out. And here it might sound like a catch-22, but the best way to get ESCOM out of debt and to get the lowest energy prices for consumers and businesses and industries in South Africa is to grow demand of electricity. And that's what will give ESCOM the capability to deploy more solar and wind, the cheapest uh, energy you can buy and grow their way out. But to do that, ESCOM has to deliver uh, electricity at a reasonable price to its customers. And so what I would be doing if I were uh, you know, in the energy ministry there is I'd be saying, okay, we're gonna have to endure this, this disruption that's happened, but eventually we're gonna get back to manufacturing. We're gonna get back to some businesses being open. What's our plan for how we use South Africa's incredible endowment of sun and wind, some of the best on the planet that should give South Africa some of the cheapest energy on the planet to grow our manufacturing base here, to use that to help rebuild the economy, to create more jobs going forward, and in parallel, to pull ESCOM out of its debt crisis that it's been in for so long. So, I mean, uh, the one problem that we're facing is that some of our renewable energy projects have taken a knock due to COVID, and a lot of the funding has been uh, pulled back. So, you know, how, how do yeah. we deal with that? So this is the opposite crisis response of, of what almost every other country has done. In most countries, uh, what's happening right now is that coal plants are being hit and renewable plants are being hit the least. And the reason for that is this. When you've got a solar plant or a wind plant, it has zero uh, operating cost, almost. It has zero fuel cost. So literally, the electricity that's producing, uh, you already paid for by building the, the power plant. So it gets first dibs in the market. Whereas to burn coal plant, to burn coal, to keep that coal plant operating while breaking a contract with a solar or wind plant, you have real ongoing fuel costs. You've got to load that thing with coal uh, that you have to pay for. So what ESCOM is doing is completely backwards. In the US, in Europe, uh, it's coal that's seeing its share decline and renewable contracts are being honored. And that's also, by the way, Good for South Africans with cleaner air. It would be good for South Africans to have cleaner air. We know that air pollution makes COVID worse, increases the propensity of, of getting sick and getting really sick. So this is not the time to be pulling back from renewables. It's the time to be taking the opportunity with low demand to let some of those coal plants run at a lower rate and keep the solar and wind that you've contracted honor those contracts and keep that producing. Wow, so yeah, so it's gonna be a journey. It's gonna be a process uh, ahead of us and hopefully we can uh, start picking up the right strategies as, as, as you've just mentioned. Um, guys, we're getting a whole bunch of questions from the audience and we're gonna, we've got about uh, 15, 20 minutes left. We're gonna jump into live Q&A. Um, question from, from Mark Colley. How long until machine learning algorithms catch up on the change? To anyone in the panel. I'm happy to take That's that. That's Ashley's uh, question. <laughs> uh, wow, how long before machine learning uh, takes, takes to catch up? Um, I, I, I think, remember, uh, these machines, uh, it's people who build them. Uh, so. I think it's how quickly do we adapt to transforming our businesses to use them. Uh, these are barely just machines that, that humans have built, but have massive processing ability. So the ability, they calculate billions and billions of simulations a lot more accurately than groups of humans could do. And uh, machines have relied on this learning from this grouping of humans and giving a better output. And due to the result of that, we see better accuracies in business outputs and also um, a reduced cost for businesses to operate. 
So I think the 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 a better question would be how long before more companies adopt this technology so we can see the full benefit of um of of what technology can do for us. I truly believe that the future uh, or a massive player in this is technology. And if South Africa were to really want to leapfrog, uh, it's going to be uh, an absolute must for businesses, small, medium, and large, uh, to adopt as much tech um, as possible, not bulky tech, but lean technology that really solves a specific problem. And uh, I, I truly think that's, that's our way out of this. Great. Thanks. Thanks so much for that, Ash. We're getting a number of uh, education questions where we will be talking about reimagining education next week. But let's hear from our panel now on, the, on this question. We've got a question from Rahul Patel. And um, Rahul is asking, as I'm sure many of us have children who are remote learning, what is the panel's view on the future of education? What is the future for traditional brick and mortar schools? Uh, anyone who wants to take that, that answer? Mez, over to you. Sure. Well, A, I think this is going to be a great experiment. We're going to learn a whole lot from it. There's some great resources out there for kids now. Uh, but I don't see brick and mortar schools, at least for the you know primary and secondary school, going away. We know that a lot of what they do is they, they teach socialization uh, as well as actually uh, learning the, the, the books, if you will. Uh, but certainly we're going to see more and more what works. Now, I think uh, where we're going to see potentially more change is the university sector, where universities uh, are trying to adapt now and offer remote learning uh, for their, their students. And I think those students are somewhat more able to self-motivate. And the universities are stuck in a, a catch-22 that what they're going to try to communicate right now is, oh, we can deliver the same quality education uh, online, and so you should pay us full tuition. Uh, and yet, uh, as soon as uh, this crisis has passed, you should all come uh, back to us physically on campus. And so I think that's going to expose uh, just how much we can do uh, with a remote education at that, that higher educational level. No, no, thanks, no, thanks so much for that. Kim, do you have any views on that, that answer? Yeah, I think, no, just to supplement what uh, Ramey says, I think um, he's absolutely correct. It's not going to change primary education and at the schooling level because the, the biggest advantage of that is the social aspect. And even with my children, they get through their classes in the first hour, two hours in the morning. The schools have been amazing. And we've been very fortunate that we are in a position to have online education. They pivoted very fast. Uh, I was super impressed. But they get through their lessons a lot quicker. But what they are missing out is the social aspect. And they miss that the most. The fact, just that social stimulation. Because I think that's where you learn your biggest lessons in life. It's, it's relationships and how you deal with the ups and downs and, you know, of friendships and... Uh, that's so, so yes, I do agree with Ramaz there where it's not going to change, I don't feel, you know, no, so, school setting you know, too For much. us, we've but actually pivoted. Oh. Sorry to interrupt you there. So we've actually pivoted okay. into virtual reality learning uh, using this platform called VHive, which is an interesting new way because it's quite engaging for the, the kids. They're used to these gaming environments. But uh, moving could on I to the next question. Oh, sorry? Sorry, Mick. Could I just add to this? Because I have to use this example if we're going to talk about education. And uh, sure. just, just one thing. I think the first thing to note is around brick and water schools is uh, there's a portion uh, which probably makes up the top 5% or, uh, well, don't quote me on the stat here, but uh, there's a minority that has the ability to have data, to have uh, an iPad, a laptop, uh, have the constant uh, data access at the current cost it is in South Africa. And then there's uh, the mass of South Africa kids don't have this. And um, I was just talking to Dario Fanuki, who's my business, one of the other founders of Isazi. His mom is a teacher, Mrs. Fanuki. And I think it's St. Benedict's that I thought this was quite an interesting model or, or change that they've just adopted. Uh, I, I hope it's the right school. But uh, basically, all the teachers that taught sport or, or PE type of teachers 
are now at school and all the kids that don't have access to data are still coming to the school so they can learn using the online platform. And these teachers who uh, would have normally not been able to teach online are actually uh, helping to, to monitor this process and let it happen. So I still do think uh, that uh, there is a place for brick and mortar schools, uh, especially with the current cost and accessibility to data for the masses of, of, of South Africa's population when it comes to kids. Uh, and, and then the, the second thing is these schools can now also be used for multiple different things for people who don't or complete other micro job tasks uh, when they don't have access to this data. So I think um, I, uh, the, the, and the one last point is I, I truly believe that uh, your STEMs, your maths and science, um, any parent and any student uh, should recognize this as an opportunity for their child to learn almost anything about science online. And uh, if they are in a position to really try and further that, because uh, the more science scientists and engineers we can get at this time is really going to uh, help propel our country forward. No, I think that's a really inspiring story. And I've, I've actually just finished reading Danielle which is uh, the new book by Ray Kurzweil. And it's probably the, the most inspiring uh, nonfiction novel I've ever read. And I've, and I've never learned so much from a book like that. So check out Danielle. It will make you want to study science and want to uh, learn programming. Um, we've got quite a number of other questions going on. We're going to, just, we're going to take two more questions. Uh, one is from Nathaniel Morgan Pillay. The tourism and and more specifically, Airbnb short-term rental market has taken a knock. What are your thoughts of the panel on pivots in this industry, particularly given more regulation in this area? I can give you, I can talk a very little bit about that. That's not my main area of focus, but I have heard some interesting stories of what some of these, well, it would be maybe slightly different with some of these B&Bs, but what a lot of the, and I'm sure you guys know as well, actually, what are the, a lot of the hotels and guest houses and that have done have been pivoting into supplying areas for people to come and isolate, self-isolate. So there is a lot of that happening, which I think is quite innovative. And awesome, man. yeah, and I'm not sure what else. Have you seen anything around you know, I think this? what I've seen a few things. Um, you know, here in the United States, we have a homelessness problem. So I've seen uh, uh, places here in the Seattle area in Washington State. Uh, we've actually, uh, because homeless people in crowded shelters uh, or on the street uh, are more at risk of passing around COVID, that in some places the, the state or county has rented hotel rooms for them. Uh, and it turns out in many places you can do the math and find that that's actually cheaper than the cost of society of homelessness. But look, we've just got to be honest. Uh, there are sectors of society, uh, sectors of business that are going to be brutalized. And, you know, airlines are one of them. And I think hospitality is another one. And to think that Airbnb is, is hospitality, <clears throat> I think that that's in for a very rough ride. Uh, and I, I think the other thing I would say is, by all means, you know, try to, to pivot, experiment, try things, see what works. But be prepared that we're going to be dealing with some form of COVID crisis, not just the next few months, but for the next two years. That's the, the scale of this, right? We're, yes. we're not anywhere near a vaccine, most likely. It's going to take a while. So uh, do the experimentation, look for a pivot but also get yourself mentally prepared. And if you possibly can, financially prepared for this to be a marathon, not a sprint. I mean, Mez, this is a complete 360 for you. you you're still living on a plane, traveling around the world nonstop, <laughs> uh, and now you're at home. So, you know, how is this pivoted? Right. How has it been for you, this change? Well, this is the longest I've gone without being on an airplane in probably a decade. Uh, and there's certainly a lot to love about it. Uh, it's different. You know, I think also the uh, conferences are not what they once were. But then again, we uh, sometimes have events. Uh, people I see experimenting quite a lot in what it's like to do an online event. 
And I've seen lots of people say that was actually the best event I've been to. That was a better event uh, than uh, having the same thing in person. So I think we are finding that uh, these new ways of working, while they're not perfect, and while they're not in every way superior to face-to-face, -to -face, have new benefits that people are appreciating. So have you pivoted to doing a lot more uh, virtual online and that type of thing? Are you seeing a, lot, a big take up of that? Uh, I've been doing some virtual online uh, speaking. I've, I've devoted myself actually about half of my time to a single uh, clean energy startup right now uh, that I'll talk about at some point when they come out of uh, stealth mode. And uh, going back to doing some uh, fundamental uh, analysis of trends, I just published a new piece uh, looking at the long-term trends in solar power, updating something I did five years ago. So taking advantage of this time as best that I can. Yeah, so you're getting back to, to the, the writing and the authoring. Um, I don't know if many of you know that Ramez is one of the uh, top 100 science, science fiction writers of all time by Goodreads and his Nexus series, which in our Share the Tech Love section, which is coming up next, we're going to be doing a giveaway of his uh, trilogy book set. Um, so thanks so much. And um, we're going to move on to a bit of a tougher question for you all. And uh, this question is, what is the future of rural communities looking like with all these technological advancements, i.e. any chance we will start seeing decentralization of tech from urban areas spreading to rural areas? Um, Ashley or Kim, if you want to start with that one. Actually, you start to... tech. <laughs> sure, great. Uh, well, the first um, open answer is I really hope so. I really, really do. I think um, I think the the biggest risk we face, and uh, when when you someone who's in technology, your biggest risk is uh, you know the old story of um, if the only tool you have is a hammer, then every problem looks like a nail. And I really, really don't believe that the solution to everything is technology and we should apply it in irresponsible ways. And when I say that, I mean, um, sometimes putting too much of tech in a place could make a community uh, too dependent on it and uh, cause other issues later on. Um, I do think the, with, with the population numbers um, in South Africa, uh, there's a massive play for technology to, or, or, and education as well to be democratized across. And uh, the one advantage we do have is the cost of data and the cost of, of devices are dropping. Uh, maybe, um, and, and they're dropping at, at a quite a aggressive rate, and we hope to see more of that. Uh, but the biggest way of, um, I, I believe, for, for anybody to grow, to get out of this position and to repeat what Rami said, is how do we grow out of this? Um, would be to assist or, or get young individuals involved in any form of technology companies. And we should look to um, help from private sector and from government to help us export our technology. So whatever is created in South Africa, how do we, how do we get the rest of the world to use it? Um, I think there's a very, very small percentage uh, of the amount of technology that's exported out of South Africa is, is, is less than a percent in total contribution to GDP. If we can actually grow that during this time, uh, that'll be fantastic and have more people involved in it. And uh, that we need help from private sector as well as government. This is what an opportunity to readdress tax laws and IP legislation around exporting technology out of South Africa. Uh, this is one time for any technology company uh, where the playing field is now equalized for any company that is now sitting in Silicon Valley or Tel Aviv or anywhere around the world. The way they sell their product is going to be online the way we sell our product. So the table, it, it, it's equalized. And what's even uh, one silver lining in, in, in what we've seen with our RAND go up and down is uh, right now for what someone will get 
uh, for a dollar in 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 the states or, or you would be um, around 17 times the, the value that someone else could give them just based yes. on our currency so no, i think, so, I, th so, I think so that's now, a fa absolutely fantastic point on how to be ad agile in this time of crisis and a, and a great practical example we need policy to change and we need to be able to access this global economy mm -hmm by using online. So I think that's a fantastic practical yep. tip. Um, we've run out of time, so I'm going to allow the last two panelists to have some closing statements. Um, Kim and Ramez, if you want to just uh, give a closing statement, any other practical tips uh, for guys to be agile in this time of crisis? Well, I just want to quickly just um, add on to Ashley's comment there about leveling the playing fields, because South Africans are by nature very entrepreneurial and have proven time and again to adapt and adjust. We just need to be given equal level playing fields in terms of regulation, access to technology and that. But I think if we take a step back from a macro perspective, this coronavirus alone hasn't broken our world. You know, it's just exposed a world that is already breaking. And if this virus has taught us anything, it's humility and that it doesn't discriminate. And that's why we have to work together because we can't allow it, the virus, to attack uh, weaker countries where they have um, weaker public systems and governance. We all in this together, we're connected and we're in a shared ecosystem. And as soon as we realize that interdependence, we'll understand that helping is not charity. We have to work together to solve issues and make our world a better place. No, thanks so much for that, Kim. And uh, Mez, over to you. A closing statement? I just really agree with what Kim just said. I think uh, aiming for a higher purpose and aiming to make a positive difference uh, is going to be remembered. You know, on the agility side, I'd say more than anything else, keep experimenting, keep making it safe for the people on your team to come up with new ideas. Don't be afraid of failure. Uh, this is a stressful time. Try new things. And if a lot of them fail, that just leads you towards uh, finding out what does work. But what Kim just said is brilliant and so important. This is a time to try to make a positive impact on the world and uh, people around you, your employees, your customers, your partners, your neighbors are going to remember who stepped up and try to do a good thing uh, for other people uh, in this time of crisis. Well, well th thanks so much for that. Th thanks so much to our panel. It's been a real pleasure having you all here today. Uh, thanks for your time, your knowledge and what you're doing in this world. Uh, we're all really grateful and appreciate being able to share this time with you. And uh, to the rest of our audience, please don't go anywhere. Next up, we have our giveaway section, uh, sharing the tech love. <clears throat> and now for my favorite part, sharing the tech love. This is our way of giving back. Each week, all the registered guests will go into a random draw and up to three lucky winners will be eligible to win a prize. The prizes will vary from physical to digital products. Tonight's prize is something really awesome. We're going to be giving away Ramez Nam's Nexus Trilogy series on Kindle, which as I mentioned has been rated in the top 100 science fiction novels of all time. So what we're going to do here is we're going to use a randomizer and we're just going to pick three winners from the registered guests. Tamsin, please can you give us the winners? And our first winner is Janita Storm. Well done, Janita Storm from Investec. You have won the trilogy from, uh, Ram, of, of Nexus from Ramez Nam. And we're going to pull the next winner. The next winner is Halisha Naidu. Halisha Naidu from Dimension Data. Well done. You've won yourself the Nexus Trilogy book. We will be sending you uh, the Kindle Trilogy. And our third winner, Isabel Armindo from Deloitte. Uh, well done, Isabel. You have also won yourself the, the Nexus Trilogy. Uh, and thanks to Deloitte for the great turnout tonight. I, th I think there's quite a number of you, so that's, that random uh, award is, uh, is in your favor. And uh, we'll be sending you your prizes soon. 
We just want to say thanks so much for all of you joining us here tonight. I hope you have had a great time and took away some insights and knowledge on how to be more agile and adaptable in this time. We all need to stick together and collaborate so that we can get through this and come out ahead. Next week, we'll be looking at how we can reimagine education with an incredible lineup from Taddy Blatcher, an SU faculty member and the founder of Maharishi Institute, which has helped over 18,000 South Africans get educated and create jobs and employment in major positions in corporate South Africa. To our other guest, Esther Wojcicki, who has written two novels, How to Raise Successful People and Simple Lessons for Radical Results and Moonshots in Education. Esther, who I met in Costa Rica earlier this year before the lockdown, told me that she taught Steve Jobs' kids and she and her own daughters are, are rock stars. One of them is the current CEO of YouTube and the other is the CEO of 23andMe. And finally, Jos Dirks, who is our SU faculty on education and is also the founder of Nova AR and AR educational platforms. Make sure to register on our website to get informed of all the updates and stand a chance to win in the Share the Tech Love giveaway next week. You can join any of our social pages as well as like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Please make sure to help educate students from the Maharishi Institute by donating. All you have to do is scan the QR code on the screen and all the proceeds go to buying data and devices for students learning remotely. Let's help keep these students going and keep them helping them educated. As we mentioned at the beginning of the show, we're going to end with something beautiful, a musical performance by Denny. Denny is a multi-talented South African singer-songwriter with a catalog that's ready to be showcased to the international music scene. Her upcoming EP, due to be released in 2020, is a rhythmic blend of Afro soul and contemporary jazz. Please make sure to get hold of Denny at her social handles and, or at Su, uh, Sutu Mafia. It's been a real pleasure hosting you. I'm Mick Mann. Let's future-proof Africa together. I really hope you had a good time. Stay safe and keep smiling. Over to you, Denny.